Hello, I'm Regina LaBelle, the Acting Director of National Drug Control Policy, speaking to you from the White House, where we're recognizing National Recovery Month 2021. I want to thank everyone who's worked to make this year's Recovery Month memorable and found ways to connect at a time when that's hard to do. Today, we're hosting a special program in honor of International Recovery Day. We'll hear from President Biden, we'll hear a special announcement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and we'll host a conversation featuring leaders and people in recovery about the diversity and resilience of recovery, the variety of pathways to recovery, equity, and the family and community dimensions of recovery. The group will also talk about the connections between harm reduction, recovery support services, and recovery-ready workplaces. They'll share resources for people in or seeking recovery and those with family members or friends affected by substance use disorder. Before we start, I want to recognize the many lives lost to overdose. These are our friends, family, neighbors. While we celebrate people in recovery and the journey to recovery, for too many people, recovery remains out of reach. Too many people are unable to get the care and support they need. We have a lot to do to make sure that recovery is for everyone. And that's the theme for this year's Recovery Month. Ensuring access to recovery for everyone aligns with the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to equity. And by expanding harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services, we can put recovery within reach of more people. We're calling for increasing access to recovery support services, expanding the addiction workforce, and advancing recovery-ready workplaces. So people in the workforce with a substance use disorder can get the help and support they need to be successful. As we develop these policies, we must have people in recovery at the table who share their lived experience and perspective to make sure policies address the needs of people who are in or seeking recovery and those experiencing active addiction. And we have some great people in recovery on our team, from the President's Cabinet to the Department of Health and Human Services and here at the Office of National Drug Control Policy, people who are making a tremendous difference on the nation's policies. They're working every day to help remove the stigma surrounding substance use disorder so more people get the help they need to achieve recovery. To support this work, President Biden has proposed increasing the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant by 84%, a total of $3.5 billion annually. And for the first time, the President has called for the Block Grant to include a 10% set aside for recovery support services. This set-aside will make sure recovery support services have a sustainable source of ongoing funding. This funding is necessary as we build and sustain our nation's recovery support services infrastructure. These policies are in place because President Biden is committed to supporting the millions of Americans already in recovery and those who are seeking it. Now I'd like to share a message for National Recovery Month from President Biden. Across America, approximately 23 million people are in recovery from a substance use disorder, and millions more are affected by the addiction. As National Recovery Month concludes, I want to celebrate all of you out there who are in recovery. And let those of you who are not yet in recovery or who have loved ones who are with substance abuse disorder know that you're not alone. This is personal to millions of families. This is personal to my family. My son has written about it. And I know, I know that there's hope. Treatment works. Recovery is possible. And my administration is here to support every person and every family on their journey to recovery. Through the American Rescue Plan, we've delivered nearly $4 billion to strengthen and expand mental health and substance abuse disorder services. We're working with Congress to increase funding for states to ramp up recovery support. We're expanding coverage and lowering costs to make treatment for substance use available to more people. And today, Enrollment in the Affordable Care Act coverage, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program are all at the all-time high. And for more people than ever, they'll now have access to treatment. And we're also investing in key tools and proven interventions to prevent overdoses and deliver help to underserved communities. And we're supporting all the caregivers, health care providers, and family members who are helping people on their journey to recover. Together, we celebrate with those of you who are in recovery and grieve for those who have lost someone.
We hold all of you on our hearts, and we commit ourselves to helping more families know the joy and relief of recovery. You know, when we work together, support each other, we put recovery within reach for more people. We can do this. Thank you, and God bless you all. Hello, I am honored to be here with you to celebrate National Recovery Month, now in its 32nd year. And I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the unique pathways of the 23 million Americans in recovery, along with those who have assisted and provided support along their journeys. This year's theme, Recovery is for Everyone, every person, every family, every community, reminds us that recovery does not exist in a vacuum. We are all called to welcome everyone to recovery, to lower barriers, create inclusivity, and broaden our understanding by listening to those in or seeking recovery. And our commitment to and support of recovery does not end with Recovery Month. In fact, recovery is one of the guiding principles of SAMHSA's work. And although this is my first Recovery Month as Assistant Secretary, I have had the opportunity to support Recovery Month over the course of my 20-year behavioral health career. And like many of you, recovery has particular importance to me. Mental health and substance use disorders have touched my family. Fortunately, behavioral health and recovery services were there to offer support. I am inspired by the stories, goals, aspirations, and challenges overcome by individuals in recovery. And this inspiration motivates me in my role as Assistant Secretary. I am committed to growing and expanding recovery support services and have identified recovery as one of SAMHSA's four cross-cutting principles. All SAMHSA centers will work to promote and support recovery practices, elevate the strong and rep proud recovery community, and service providers and community members across the nation who help people find and sustain long-term recovery. Many people have benefited from and continue to rely on peer support services as part of their support for recovery. And some of you may have decided to become peer recovery coaches yourselves. I commend you for reaching out to help others, for sharing your lived experiences and obstacles and successes. You serve an important role. You provide hope and you assist with critical support for individuals in need by providing crucial outreach and engagement especially within communities that are under-resourced. According to SAMHSA's National Survey on Drug Use and Health, nearly 90% of people 12 and older with substance use disorder did not receive treatment. And similarly, 55% of people 18 or older with a mental illness did not get the help they need. Unfortunately, people are still silenced by stigma that surrounds mental illness and substance use disorders. And yet we know mental illness and substance use disorders are like any other medical condition. Those data points are constant reminders that there remains a lot of work to do. As we celebrate our successes this month, let's not forget that this is not the end, but rather a milestone along our journey. I am encouraged by President Biden's significant investments in behavioral health to assist Americans impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. On May 18th, SAMHSA distributed $3 billion from the President's American Rescue Plan to states and territories through block grants to expand access to mental health and substance use disorder prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services and supports. Further, in September, SAMHSA awarded more than $123 million in funding through six grant programs to provide multifaceted support to communities and healthcare providers battling the overdose epidemic. The six grant programs connect people who have substance use disorders to culturally appropriate evidence-based treatments and support and work to strengthen the full continuum of care for those battling substances. These are just a few of the examples of the unprecedented amount of funding distributed to support state and community efforts to improve access to treatment and recovery services. As we close Recovery Month this year, I have an exciting announcement to make. SAMHSA will solidify our commitment to recovery through the launch of a new Office of Recovery that will be housed within my office, the Office of the Assistant Secretary. A true recovery orientation is about building on individual and system strengths passionate, committed staff and leadership with a sophisticated understanding of recovery 
and systems that already exist to promote recovery will be the backbone to promote SAMHSA's recovery policies. SAMHSA has a long history of supporting recovery, dating back to 1998, when the first recovery community support programs were funded. These programs were primarily focused on advocacy, but the emphasis changed in 2001 for organizations to develop peer recovery supports. Recovery from mental illness and substance use disorders is enhanced by peer-operated services, which include developing new social and interpersonal networks, service provisions such as housing, employment, education, and outreach, advocacy on an individual or broader level for change and justice. As I said earlier, recovery does not happen in a vacuum. SAMHSA's Office of Recovery will bring together invaluable voices of our communities to drive the overarching goals and objectives of the Office of Recovery strategy. SAMHSA also recognizes the inclusion of families and loved ones and allies is crucial to the process. SAMHSA's Office of Recovery will ensure that recovery is a guiding principle in SAMHSA's policies, programs, and services will promote the involvement of people with lived experience throughout the agency and stakeholder activities. We'll identify health disparities in high risk and vulnerable populations and ensure equity for recovery support services across the nation. These are just a few of the critical areas of work of SAMHSA's Office of Recovery. We welcome you to join us as we launch this exciting new office and help us shape it into something that will help more Americans find and sustain long-term recovery. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to celebrate with all of you. I look forward to many more Recovery Month celebrations during my tenure as Assistant Secretary. Remember that we here at SAMHSA are all with you to continue to forge together to promote recovery for all, for every person, every family, every community across the country. Thank you. Hi, I'm Labor Secretary Marty Walsh and I am in recovery. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for access to treatment covered by my union's health plan. I would not be here if people in recovery had not shared their gift with me and showed me how to live my life one day at a time. At every level of this administration, President Biden has appointed people who live this issue on a personal level. And with the President, we are committed to expanding access to prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery supports. At the Department of Labor, We are strengthening our enforcement of the law by requiring parity for mental health and substance use coverage in employment-based health insurance. And we are making sure that working people understand the resources available to them and their families. I know many of us have had a tough time during the pandemic, but for everyone in recovery, everyone thinking about recovery, all those who are struggling or worried about a loved one, I want you to know you're not alone, there is hope, and recovery is for everyone. Hey everybody, this is John Winslow. I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means I haven't used alcohol or other substances for over 45 years now. I also happen to be the founder of International Recovery Day. If you go to internationalrecoveryday.org, you'll have an opportunity at no charge to register to launch your own virtual recovery firework only on September 30th and your firework will be launched by, with, uh, along with countless others around the globe. You'll be able to see it on a two-dimensional map where your recovery is symbolized with the uh, recovery of many others. Uh, we're talking about all addictions, all recovery pathways, all on the same day. We're also r- lighting up the world in purple on September 30th as well. So we have structures all around the globe that are turning purple, symbolizing the recovery movement. So please join us on September 30th. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Today we are holding an important discussion with recovery leaders and advocates. I wanna thank our speakers so far from President Biden, to Acting Director LaBelle, Assistant Secretary Delphin Rittman, Secretary Walsh, and John Winslow for their contributions to this program.
What a great way to wrap up Recovery Month and to celebrate International Recovery Day. My name is Tom Hill, and I am Senior Policy Advisor at the Office for National Drug Control Policy. Even more important than that, I'd like you to know that I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. And for me, that means that I haven't had any alcohol or drugs in my body for 29 years. It also means that I've been able to show up to events like this and to jobs like this in a way that I never dreamed possible for myself. I'm really happy today to have the opportunity to speak with some of the leading highlights of the recovery community who collectively represent very diverse pathways, communities, and experiences. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dominique Clemens James. We call her Dr. CJ. She serves as clinical counselor and collegiate recovery coordinator at the North Carolina a and State University. And she serves on the board of the Association for Recovery in Higher Education. Donna Dimitrovic is a senior advisor for recovery at SAMHSA. She's a person in long-term recovery and Donna previously served as a director for the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, CSAP. We also have Phil Rutherford. Phil is chief operating officer at Faces and Voices of Recovery. He's a recovery coach, an advocate, and a passionate member of the recovery community. We have Zach Talbot. Zach is a person in long-term recovery from opioid use disorder and serves as a treatment center director and board chair of the National Alliance for Medication Assisted Recovery. And finally, Linda Woods. While retired, Linda is far from inactive. She's a person in long-term recovery. She's worked as a social worker serving the Native American community for over 30 years and currently serves as cultural consultant for the Intertribal Council of Michigan. Linda is a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians in Michigan and is a tribal elder and a veteran. Today, we'll be discussing issues such as equity, multiple pathways to recovery, medications for opioid use disorder, the intersection of harm reduction, peer recovery support services, and treatment. We'll also talk about recovery-ready workplaces, policies and, and implications, and expanded substance use prevention and treatment block grant, and a 10% set aside for recovery support services that could have potential repercussions of all the work we do. We'll also discuss the potential impact of the establishment of the recovery office at the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration. So I think we're ready to launch into discussion with our panelists, and I'd like to start on the topic of equity. As Acting Director LaBelle mentioned, the Biden administration is working very hard to address longstanding historic inequities in access to health care services, housing, employment, income, and the full rights of citizenship. This year's Recovery Month theme Recovery is for everyone, every person, every family, every community resonates with that priority. And while equity, equity issues play out differently from one community to another, there are certainly some cross-cutting elements. So I'd like to start with the question, what are some key equity issues you see for people with substance use disorder and in your communities? And I'd like to start with Linda Wood. Had to unmute myself. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. And um, this is about equity. Well, you know, I was telling um, um, Peter earlier that for the population here in the United States, the people with uh, the least amount of population, so to speak, we have the most. Um, issues with substance abuse uh, disorders, mental health, and, and um, everything else. The, the list is long, you know, as to what um, we're off the chart. And yet we're the ones who uh, struggle the most with uh, recovery 
issues. And um, I'm not sure what that's all about, but I get, I got sober in 1969. So that means I have over 50 years of sobriety. And I got sober through the 12 step way. There were no treatment centers then that I am aware of. And I got sober in California, San Jose, California. And, and so um, for me personally, I think as a person of, of tribal descent, I look for my own wherever I go. And uh, when I served in the military, I served in the United States Air Force, I still look for my own and I usually partnered with someone who looked kind of like me. And I think um, that might be something that uh, may contribute to equity and our lack of um, is that we, we are proud of our heritage, even with, even with our substance use and everything. Uh, we are proud of that. So um, getting sober, I, I am an alcoholic. I never got involved with drugs or haven't even smoked pot. You know, back in the 60s, that was pretty much the rage in California was uh, pot and other substances, but I, I just never did. Alcohol was it for me. But um, getting sober uh, was very difficult for me. Uh, speaking was very difficult for me. And a lot of our people are, we tend to be a little bit, um, we're not as vocal, I guess you could say, as other folks are. And, and we, we observe a lot, we sense a lot, and we um, come from a spiritual base, so to speak. And, and so um, I don't know if is now the time you want me to talk about the staff or not um, and how it ties in with, with uh, the topic. Sure, Linda. Okay. Well, as a veteran and as a female, as a woman veteran, uh, you know, equity <laughs> participated in the military with me also because women were like, this much compared to it's a man's world in the military and very much so when I was in in the 60s I was in during the Vietnam uh, era and so when I left the military I got my honorable discharge in 1966 and um, I, I came home and because of the way we were treated I never stood up and said that I was ever a veteran I just it wasn't until I came home, like I said, I got sober in California. So, but I, I came home at some point and then I, my parents and my relatives encouraged me to stand up as a veteran. And I said, no, I can't, that's just for the men. And so what happened then was that um, uh, I saw witness men carrying Eagle staff and I didn't know what that was. And, and so I didn't understand what the meaning was. So I, 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 just kind of, I just thought it was something that the men did. But that planted a seed in my head from the early 90s. So then when I retired, I in 2008 and 2011, this eagle, she's a real eagle. She, she uh, died in 2008 also. And, and she came, she fell into the water and she was frozen in place. And I was too, was frozen in many ways, even in my recovery. So anyway, they were looking for a, a veteran to present this eagle head too. And um, in 2011, um, they selected me and I was totally flabbergasted and I didn't understand, I says, well, I'd like to make an Eagle Staff for women veterans. And the, the men who were at this presentation thing, uh, ceremony said, good, it's time. It's time for the women to stand up and it's time for this. So I had a lot of help putting her together and everything. 
And in 2012, she came out in our traditional powwow and, and I had a ceremony and we were present, I was presented this, this beautiful um, eagle staff that I created with some other uh, women. And so um, she came with 10 eagle feathers. And since 2012, we now have 59 eagle feathers on her and one condor feather, which is represents the, the Southern indigenous people. And there's a long prophecy about all that and I won't get into it, but many of those feathers on her are from people who have sobriety. Like there's, a, there's several white eagle feathers on her, 25 years of sobriety. My cousin gave me a, uh, an eagle feather to re represent her sobriety. And then I have a feather on there from a woman I met in New Mexico um, a couple of years ago who um, her son died of heroin overdose. And so that eagle feather represents uh, heroin, drug abuse, and, and um, overdoses of, of what happened there. And so we go many places where people are, uh, and we have some mental health issues uh, uh, represented on her as well. Um, like all of the abuses, you know, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, and all of that. Those feathers are on there for her, for that as well for the healing of of that. So uh, all of these feathers represent, and then there's other medical issues too, like cancer, lupus, arthritis, diabetes, all of that. And and of course, our numbers go clear out of the realm for all of that. But she is about healing. She's and to me, recovery is about healing from whatever our trauma we've had in life. And it's broadened my whole scope of recovery, what it means. And, and wherever tribal community I go to, she is, we're both welcomed. And, and where I oftentimes get a feather from that community to represent whatever issues there are there. And I mean, thank, thank you so much for sharing that that's a really great lead into equity and such a powerful, powerful symbol that staff represents. Really appreciate you, you leading us off with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such an honor for both of us to be here and, and to, I, you know, we have a powerful story to share with the world and thank you for allowing me to share just a little bit of it. Absolutely. We're pleased to have you both. Thank you. Phil, um, why don't you tell us just a little bit about um, equity issues that are being addressed by Faces and Voices of Recovery now, national organization. Sure, thanks, Tom. Um, I think one of the things that we've done at Faces and Voices is really take a look at how the recovery movement, uh, specifically the new recovery movement that's been taking place over about the past 20 years or so, how that has worked itself out as it pertains to equity. What happened with... Uh, George Floyd last year, really, it really drove us to, to kind of take a look at were we delivering products and services to the community in an equitable way? And were we making sure that our, um, the organizations that were part of our national organization, which is ARCO, the Association of Recovery Community Organizations, were we really representing the equity that we know are we know that equity is a value that is held by most people in recovery, but were we really building programs and services that supported that? So we got involved with some other organizations and produced something called a Recovery North Star document, which really was an examination of what has gone on and kind of what our path forward is. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, turns out there's uh, some systemic problems with equity in the recovery space, just like every other part of American life. And we have, we have made a commitment with these other organizations to, to take some steps to, to make changes there. Specifically, and I, I don't want to alarm anyone, but I'm Black. Um, so specifically, the, the, within the Black community, uh, we've looked at how recovery shows up, and not just recovery, but how substance use disorder shows up and, and criminalization associated with, with Black people using drugs and what that recovery pathway looks like. 
not everyone gets the option to go to treatment. And um, we found that there, there are some, there's some differences in the recovery journey that people walk. What we do know is that recovery works. And we know that it works for, for, for people that, that attempt it. So we wanna make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to get to that recovery. So that's, that's kind of what we've been working on. Thank you so much. And Dr. Um, CJ, I'm gonna let you finish us off about how equity uh, is playing out in the work you're doing with uh, your collegiate recovery community. Absolutely. Um, so much just like recovery, collegiate recovery communities have been around um, at major universities and cities for at least since the 70s. Um, at North Carolina A&T, uh, where I coordinate our collegiate recovery, we are the first historically black college to establish um, a collegiate recovery program simply because there's never been an identified need, so to speak, for um, particular populations of colors, more specifically black um, people who are trying to attempt recovery or who are trying to learn more about it or who are just trying to, you know, get access to some type of recovery support service. Um, and so that was the major reason we started our program. We, you know, wanted to make sure that this population was being, you know, addressed and supported in such a way. And so a big part of just kind of your original equity question is, you know, a key equity issue is access for this population access, not just for college level students, but for people of color. Um, like Phil was saying, uh, everyone can afford treatment and there are at least six treatment facilities around my state and they're in beautiful locations, the mountains, the beach, all of this, but they're not in areas where populations like mine and students like mine live and work and exist. And so to not have access is a huge problem. And so it's particularly at the collegiate recovery level, we wanna make sure that the next generation of people coming from higher ed are able to either go out in their communities and become a leader in recovery themselves or just be, you know, kind of from an each one teach one approach where it's like, this is my recovery lifestyle. I came from a campus where recovery, you know, is autonomous. Recovery is what I make it and it should be supported and I should know where resources are. And so to pass that kind of philosophy and legacy on wherever they go um, is also kind of a key um, part of our program. The other key part is partnering with other HBCUs in our area to make sure the population is covered across my state, as well as with other community partners and predominantly white institutions, because they also have students of color on their campus, but they probably don't know how to reach them. Um, so a lot of the work that we do falls under the um, scope of psychoeducation, just about recovery in general, about what recovery and recovery pathways can look for people of color and just generally how to make recovery about the person and their journey and not so much define it across the board. Excellent, thank you so, so much. Um, from equity, it's, it's not a short, uh, uh, it, 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 it's actually a very short jump to talking about many pathways. And, um, you know, if we remember uh, Phil Valentine from CCAR, that's Con Connecticut Communities for Addiction Recovery. He was uh, working with his board of directors and trying to help them figure out who was and who wasn't in recovery. And Phil sort of blurted out, a person's in recovery if they say they are. Uh, and William White, among others, has called on people to provide re peer recovery support services to develop the knowledge and skills needed to support all pathways to recovery. So just wondering how we're doing, how are we doing at supporting uh, many and diverse pathways of recovery uh, and you know, where we're doing a good job and where improvement might be needed. And I'm gonna call on Zach to, to lead us off in that conversation. Sure, um, so, and thanks to the ONDCP and the Biden administration for hosting this important conversation uh, first and foremost. I think that uh, as, an individual in long-term recovery whose recovery was facilitated by the use of an FDA-approved medication within a comprehensive approach and long-term recovery support and long-term recovery planning um, and representing, you know, with our organization, NAMA Recovery, representing those that are MAT-based recovery or MOUD, I guess, now based recovery is uh, we've come a long way. We have the fact that we have a seat here is a testament to the Biden administration, a testament to the 
to the long time work of uh, many advocates before us. Um, and so I think we've made progress there in recognizing that one size doesn't fit all, um, that um, there are different pathways and that all of them are valid. It's the pathway that helps someone the most. Um, I think a lot of that's been pushed by uh, a focus um, on the federal side and a lot of the states on evidence, what's evidence-based to help the most people but still we should support all pathways, whether they're inpatient or outpatient or medications or not, if it works for someone. Um, but there are still areas um, of exclusion. Um, if we, like you said, it's a short jump from equity, but it, here with multiple pathways and the access to medication assisted treatment programs, uh, there are still um, disparities uh, where it's based on race, um, socioeconomic status and other things to the various uh, medications and treatments that are available. We've made progress, but we still see the need for a long way to go and access to all three FDA approved medications uh, is still lacking in many areas that we've made great progress recently. Um, and I think COVID-19, uh, needless to say, as we're doing this virtually or digitally, um, has been challenging for a lot of us that we've done a lot of great virtual recovery support meetings and other advocacy activities, but uh, losing that human uh, human to human connection, I think has been difficult. So it's a unique time in which to have this conversation. So I think we're making a lot of progress overall and that we've largely done the best we can in this challenging space, but uh, there's still even the, the Support Act uh, mandate for all three meds under Medicaid. That's wonderful, but a lot of state Medicaid programs, even though they're covering all three meds now are paying rates that a lot of providers don't want to take. And so even though it's available, it, there's in some states with really low bundles and really high bars, uh, it's still not made the change we hoped it would. And so we've made progress, but I still think we have a significant ways to go on that. Thanks, Zach. Uh, and Linda, can you talk just a little bit about what multiple pathways or diverse pathways mean in Indian country? Um, thank you. Yes. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I did use the 12 steps and that's primarily where I came from. However, um, a lot of our people didn't want to uh, use the 12 steps and they didn't like getting up at meetings and standing up and talking and all this and that. But uh, so we have a gentleman, his name is Don Coyas, and he developed what's called a Wellbriety uh, movement. And what he's done is he's, uh, and many of our tribal communities uh, use this method as well. Um, but he's taken the 12 steps, but he developed it in a cultural fashion, meaning he developed um, uh, what's called a, um, Gosh, I just lost it again. I have that issue every because of my age, I guess. But anyway, he developed a way to use our culture that coincides with the 12 steps, quite frankly. And so he used the medicine wheel. That's what I was trying to talk about. He uses the medicine, uh, the medic, uh, medicine wheel to, uh, for example, steps one, two, and three. He'll put them in a certain area on the medicine wheel and talk about how that goes with our culture. And, and uh, we, we use that here too. We have a Wellbriety meeting. They call them Wellbriety meetings and so forth. And many of our tribes do use that way. Um, we also, I've noticed is that we do use our culture for, um, to help us with our recovery. We, we seek out like a medicine person who will help us um, with any physical distress or whatever, along with our, our clinical clinic with, with detox or whatever. And we'll do that as well. But we use our culture to, for example, if those who wish to pray with a pipe like we do, um, you really shouldn't be using any kind of uh, alcohol or drugs to do that kind of thing. So they promote uh, a sense of well-briety, a sense of what we, we term as Anishinaabe people, um, which means a good life. 
So our culture is very, very important. Uh, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's good to have that perspective of uh, especially blending different cultures in a way that's creative and, and helps people get better. Mm -hmm. Sort of want to move from many pathways to a specific pathways are at least considered by some a spe specific pathway is uh, talk about harm reduction and recovery. And I'd like Donna to open us up on this discussion, um, being the, the senior advisor for recovery at SAMHSA, um, like how is, recovery, how is harm reduction fitting into the sort of SAMHSA paradigm, as well as the recovery community work you've, you've been doing for a long, long time. Talk about that a little bit, be great. Thanks, Tom, and, and I'd like to thank uh, ONDCP and the administration for hosting this. Um, so, you know, at, I was thinking about harm reduction, um, you know, as my work happened over the last 20 years in the recovery space. And I, I can remember early on that when we would do harm reduction uh, work in communities, it would be out of the um, trunk of our car. And so it was kind of undercover. And so we've come a long way, right? And with the administration's American Rescue um, funding that was awarded to SAMHSA for harm reduction programs, uh, there is $30 million um, that is available to support programs across the country for harm reduction activities. And as, as the former director of CSAP, um, you know, we oversaw a lot of the overdose prevention activities across the country, the grants that we had at SAMHSA. And so the connection was that peer support uh, specialists were providing the training, they were providing uh, uh, the, the um, uh, Narcan or Naloxone uh, to communities and to folks that you know currently may be using or family members uh, across the country. And so, um, you know, there is quite a connection. You know, we, we talk about uh, people can't recover if they're dead, right? So we understand from the depths of our own uh, substance use disorders that people need the, the opportunity to be alive in order to, to get well. And so I think that, you know, the recovering community has been doing outreach for a long time. Um, maybe not so much thinking about it in the same way as we talk about harm reduction today. Um, you know, and of course, we can um, also um, we can also really enhance those activities across the country. Uh, hopefully, with this funding, we'll see some some additional support out there. But um, I think that um, you know, the recovery community really has been involved, and in probably not even realizing that's what they were doing. That. Uh... It's so great to hear you say that. And I just want to build on it a little bit. You know, it's like, like harm reduction programs have been running for decades, but they haven't been really considered part of our continuum of care. And now we talk about prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery, not necessarily in that order, but that's, you know, sort of a, a, a extended continuum of care. And this is the first time that the uh, uh, federal administration has exp explicitly incorporated harm reduction into its drug policy priorities uh, through the, the Biden-Harris administration. And like you said, Donna, peer support workers and recovery community folks have long played an important role in, uh, in uh, outreach, overdose prevention, and engagement in syringe service programs. So, you know, we've lost an incredible amount of people to overdose and um, sort of looking at sort of ways that we can um, take harm reduction and, and, and give it sort of a, a, a new way of looking at and being uh, is really, really important. And so I'm glad that you brought up a lot of those things that uh, we've been doing it for a long time. It's just sort of, it, it looks new, but it's really not. It's, 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 it's something that is just part of the many things we have um, to, to fight the overdose deaths that we're being confronted with. Um, Phil, what barriers do you think still exist in the recovery community to accepting and adopting harm reduction as a, a practice in the recovery community? Well, it sounds funny saying it, uh, but stigma. 
Uh, we talk a lot, and I say the reason it sounds funny is that at Faces and Voices, we talk a lot about stigma reduction and how to make sure that people understand that recovery is possible and there's a good face on it. But I think there's internal stigma within the recovery community around harm reduction. Um, and we we believe that, so harm reduction is recovery, recovery is harm reduction. Like, so I think that one of the chief barriers is, is possibly a lack of understanding and maybe a lack of willingness to, to be open to those multiple pathways. Um, I just my own personal experience with it, um, it's really hard for people to recover when they're dead. And I, I sincerely believe that, that whatever methodology people use to, to gain uh, meaning and purpose, or to, I didn't come up with this, health, home, purpose, and community, um, to, for, for people to achieve that, if, if someone wants to head that way, we should support them. Now, I think as time has gone on, even in my time, um, it's not in my my bio, but I am also a person living in long-term recovery. And, and my um, my experience in my particular recovery pathway is that there's been a, a change even in the attitudes in that particular pathway around around harm reduction and other other methods. But we, we have to work on some central truths. One of them is people can't recover if they're dead. Another truth is um, there are FDA approved medications available. Uh, people, there's evidence, like I'm, I'm kind of a data guy, right? So there's evidence that that medication works. So it's, I'm, I'm, I am a lay person, so I don't, I'm not a doctor. So I don't really get to describe what people need to do for their recovery. I get to support them in it. That is all. You know, one of Thank the you. other things I just want to add, I think partnering with different organizations is really important too. So like prevention and health districts and uh, prevent uh, recovery communities, family organizations, as we all really start to um, understand the importance of harm reduction and working together um, will make a difference uh, across the country, as well as, you know, lifting those barriers that we might see for harm reduction activities. Yeah. That's a great point. Families have been practicing harm reduction forever. So, sorry. So speaking of families and, and students, uh, Dr. CJ at uh, North Carolina um, a and State, um, in terms of your uh, collegiate recovery programming uh, and the work you do there, how have you or have you not incorporated harm reduction practice or principles in your work? Absolutely, absolutely. So harm reduction is actually how we built our foundation of our program. Um, we found out really quickly that the population we serve was not going to fit in a cookie cutter definition of abstinence or just, you know, traditional recovery practices in general. Um, and so for us, um, and specifically to answer your question, the barriers that existed for us were lack of education, um, as well as, you know, just kind of gatekeeping stuff. So the lack of education piece. So we really focused on getting information out there, serving as the translator between the recovery world and the student populations that were coming in because um, a lot of times, and again, our population is heavily full of students of color, addiction, recovery weren't words that people were familiar with. You know, it's like, oh, I'm not addicted. This is something I just do to handle stress in my life. Well, you seem stressed a lot of the time. And I will offer this definition of addiction without calling it that to see if that resonates with you right and so part of that psycho ed piece is also you know flipping around. Critical thinking skills and really being voluntary and conscious with them simply because a lot of our students also have very special extenuating circumstances like I know it may seem unheard of but some students college education is being funded by people that traffic substances. And it's like, if I turn my back on my family that is supporting me, I am a traitor. How do I navigate this line, right? And so harm reduction comes even at a family systems level like Phil was talking about before. So for us, it's the critical thinking piece of, okay, so, you know, if you have a family history of this and of that, you know, what are your fears? What are your concerns? I just don't want to end up like uncle so-and-so. Okay, so what are your you know limitations? Are you going to try to abstain? Do you want to try moderation? Like what do you want to put on your recovery plate? And how can we support you in that? Um, the other piece of it I was mentioning before, the gatekeeping piece. 
that's been harder to kind of navigate because older generations or people that have gotten sober by traditional methods tend to either scoff or say that's not recovery you're not in it you sure you're abstaining from this but you're also moderating with that you need to abstain from everything like really trying to gatekeep and say how they're supposed to do it has really been a big piece of stigma and a really big barrier for some of our students um so we definitely try to push the harm reduction especially the independence and autonomy pieces for our students oh thank you for that and thank you for the critical thinking skill piece uh, so essential not only for young people but for everyone trying to assess where they are uh in that uh their, their own personal continuum um speaking of critical thinking skills zach um, so some people say harm reduction is uh, that, that medication for opioid use disorder is a form of harm reduction. And some people say it's a form of absence-based recovery. In your personal, your uh, professional, and your experience as an advocate, like, what's your take on that? Uh, I think it's both. Uh, I don't think I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Uh, you know, all of medicine and all of medical care and the way we treat any disorder is ultimately harm reduction. And so I would argue when we're talking about moving harm reduction as an evidence based practice, right? There's but you know what what's does the evidence show reduces harm? Uh, syringe service programs naloxone and, and the priorities of the administration, uh, for frankly, um, the we call it that when we're talking about substance use disorders, but the reality is that's how we treat every other illness and every other disorder already. Um, and so, you know, um, are we, if we're in medication supported recovery or medication assisted recovery, um, is there harm reduction incorporated into that? Absolutely. I've long argued one of the, uh, this country's first and greatest uh, harm reduction successes is methadone treatment. Um, but, it's more than that too. Um, it's also normalizes the brain, allows someone to then get the other uh, services they may need based on their individualized goals that then um, allows them to thrive. And so I think we too often get caught into silos and we get caught into these camps wherein, you know, it's either harm reduction, uh, low threshold access, which is important for a lot of individuals, but once we, to keep people alive, because obviously the greatest harm is death, but once folks like me and those of you on here that are in recovery, once we stayed alive, don't we deserve access to those services that help us thrive? Uh, and so I, I would encourage us not to think of overdose prevention as an end point, but a starting point uh, for then really empowering individuals to move on. So I would say it's both. Excellent, thank you so much. So I want to move on, you know, each of these topics, we could spend uh, hours and days talking this is such an interesting uh, conversation, uh, but wanted to move on to recovery ready workplaces. And this is a, a another priority of the Biden Harris administration. And we're looking at to advance these policies in both private and public sectors, including within the federal government. So by recovery ready workplace policies, we mean not only hiring people in recovery, but implementing policies that address substance use in the workplace by helping prevent it, by encouraging employees with substance use orders to seek help, by accommodating employees' treatment and recovery support needs, and by building a supportive workplace culture. So many employers do not realize that the majority of Americans with substance use disorder are employed they probably don't realize that a lot of people that they employ are also in recovery. Um, so the idea is, is really gaining traction um, uh, in a number of states sort of spearheaded by New Hampshire's recovery friendly workplace initiative, um, spurned a, a lot of other states and also happening on the ground with a lot of employers and a lot of trade associations are picking it up and, and looking at it as a really productive way to uh, enhance their workforce and make their workforce um, as healthy as possible. So um, in your experience of, of like what is the
Donna, I'm going to pitch this question to you first. What do you see happening in the realm of recovery ready or recovery friendly workplaces that you see that sort of positive sparks that are happening across the country? I know a place that you previously worked, Foundation for Recovery in Las Vegas did um, uh, a, tr a tremendous amount of work around recovery friendly uh, employers. So if you could talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of uh, some positive sparks that are happening across our country. Sure, sure. So. Um... Just to start off, I think the important thing um, is, you know, develop, I see the states developing uh, programs in line with what ha is happening in their own local communities and state systems, right? So I, in my previous position in Nevada, we had started a recovery friendly workplace and I was just at a, um, uh, a conference over the weekend where there was discussion around recovery friendly workplaces that are happening all across the country. And so I believe New Hampshire spearheaded it. Um, there are several others that are, that are uh, developing and it really, um, I know when, when we talked about doing it, it was really focused on supporting people in recovery in the workplace, being able to um, you know, look at maybe some policies around activities that happen that folk, you know, you, you may not want to have alcohol or, or, or um, an event that's at a bar or something like that. So, you know, they, it's growing across the country. I, you know, I was thinking as you were talking, Tom, about my own personal experience. When I got into recovery, I worked for a company that um, I, I was brand new in recovery. I think I was only maybe 60 days into reco my recovery process at that time. And my employer, employer realized how important, for me at that time, 12-step meetings were. And she every lunch hour, she would let me leave work to go to my 12-step meeting because she understood how important that was for me to sustain my recovery. And I think, you know, as we start to educate employers across the country um, and these programs are stood up in states across the country and supported by states. Uh, we, we will see the value of that kind of, um, of, of that kind of support happening. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, there are, I think maybe six um, that, are, that are happening right now. I know when I was at the event, um, the Secretary of Labor was there. Um, and he, uh, Secretary of Labor Walsh, and he was talking about recovery friendly workplaces and the importance of that. And so this administration really does support um, having that available to folks. So it's not a punitive um, activity that happens in the workplace, but really supporting people, one, if they are in recovery with, with activities and, and programs within the, the company, but also being able to support people if they are in need of some uh, treatment or recovery support services while they're employed. So, um, you know, I, I know the other thing that that uh, was discussed uh, this weekend was some of the uh, way back when, of course, um, where there used to be subsidized employment for folks that were new in recovery, that there were um, uh, organizations within states that would subsidize employment for you to employ somebody new in recovery to help pay for their salary until they got uh, probably, a, um, you know, kind of like on the job training, right? And so uh, that was one of the things that also helped support me in my early recovery, working at a company that had subsidized employment through the, um, the Department of Labor and Industry. Yeah, thanks. Phil, um, what's Face of Voices doing in this area? Um, well, thanks. Thanks for asking. This this is a, a place that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I mean, I think Donna did a, a great job of describing the, the government side. On the on the private sector side, I believe that, and we believe that there is a huge opportunity in working with chambers of commerce and the private sector and other other business entities, business collection entities to talk about the value of recovery ready workplace. Some of my own personal experience has actually been in uh, promoting peer recovery support in private businesses and the, the, the business cases there. So um, 
all of us on this call, we're, we're committed to reducing human suffering and, and helping people get well. Um, and not that they don't want that in the business sector, but it is, it is a very easy case to make that people in recovery have, have better results in, in the workplace. So one, one of the things that we did, um, and this is at a company in Minnesota, was simply looked at the cost of replacing a precision manufacturing engineer versus the cost of introducing peer recovery supports into their workplace. And it was a 10x, it was a 10x change, right? And so making, and I realize that that is not a, that was not a national strategy, that was a single business strategy, but the conversations that were had there were pretty simple. Do you, would you be interested in trying to spend X or do you want to spend 10X? Because you're already spending 10X when you replace this welder. So would you be interested in taking a gamble at spending 1X? And that, that, that argument and that conversation, um, that line of thinking went really well with this person. So they obviously use the service. And I think that there is a, there is a significant untapped opportunity across the country for organizations. And we're, we're doing it at, at more of a, a national level, like the, the US Chamber of Commerce, like trying to promote this concept of bringing people in recovery into the workplace. Another thing that uh, is, it exists is the WOTC credits. There, there, or there's a credit for, for people that previously had uh, some involvement with the criminal legal system. Why isn't there something like that for people in recovery? Uh, much like Donna said, is there is there something that we could do federally for that? So if there's anyone listening that maybe wants to write a bill, give me a call. Thanks. That's a great segue into the next uh, topic. We just have a, a few minutes left, so I want to be uh, cognizant of time. Uh, but I want to move into expanding peer recovery support services in general. So, um, you know, you heard Acting Director LaBelle um, Tell us uh, earlier that in the FY 2022 budget, uh, the president's proposed increasing the SAPT block grant from 1.9 million in fiscal year 2021 to 3.5 billion in fiscal year 22. It's a pretty big jump. And uh, establishing the first ever 10% set aside for recovery support services in the block grant. So I'm gonna go around to all five of you. You can pick one of these two questions, uh, try to keep it short. Um, how important is this funding to re peer recovery support services? Pretty general question. We know it's important. Uh, in what ways is it gonna be important? And the other one is how can people make their voices heard to policymakers about this increase and in set aside and how important it is in terms of uh, helping and saving lives and instituting recovery in our country. So those two questions, uh, keep it brief, please. I'm going to start with, I'm gonna go around my clock, uh, counterclockwise, starting with Linda Woods. Okay. There you go. Unmute myself here. Uh, well, you know, when I retired, I, uh, we were just starting to get into uh, peer recovery support services. We went through a lot of training. Uh, we met with a lot of resistance back then with, with our people because uh, back then we were all of the behavioral health um, programs in the state of Michigan with the tribes, we have 12 tribes. Uh, we would meet on a quarterly basis. And so we began to put training in and like that, but uh, a lot of uh, resistance because the tribes didn't know where these people would fit. How did they fit into their behavioral cell? And, and so I was relaying to, um, I think it was Peter earlier that when I left, there were only one tribal community that hired a peer support person. And that person is still with it, actually. He works up in Hannibal up by Escanaba and he's still doing a good job. And he's going about helping to promote peer report services. So support services. So I think this funding will definitely help a great deal because you know all of our uh, tribal programs uh we need help in in funding like that and i think 
this will help promote um, recovery support services throughout. I think we have two now, maybe three, I don't know. I'm out of the field right now, so I'm not really certain about that, but it can only help, right? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Help. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. And thanks for being with us today. I'm Thank going to turn you. it over to Zach. Sure, thanks. Um, it, I think the funding is critical. I think it's important that we ensure the funding gets down to uh, those that uh, can use it uh, and also that we have a view of competency when we're talking about peer recovery support. There's a lot of uh, lack of uniformity in, in standards and, and things like that that I think we should look at. But I think folks can let uh, their leaders know quite easily. I th we saw a huge co a coalescing of the recovery community and the treatment community coming together around the Support Act. And that's a model I think about uh, where different groups got uh, priorities in that are important overall, but everyone came together and sort of gave and took and then joined together and we had a massive push uh, to Congress and to the Senate and the bill got passed largely with the things in it all of us wanted. Um, and so I think we have a model. I think the groups like Faces and Voices, NAMA Recovery, the other uh, uh, collegiate recovery communities, all of our collective voices, if we come together, we can, uh, we can help our stakeholders uh, make a lot of noise. Fabulous, Zach, thank you. Dr. CJ. So I would say the, the funding of peer report, uh, excuse me, peer support recovery services is huge simply because as a mental health clinician, as a licensed addiction specialist, that takes years of time to acquire that education, right? But we don't have years of time. People need recovery support now, people need just regular support from people that either look like them or share the same age range or you know just have that guiding factor that people need like right now and so to fund more peer recovery support services is also huge for another reason because it's like being able to partner that older generation with the newer generation without the gatekeeping right a lot of the big disconnect is between you know, those that go to school and make this a career and those that have actually lived this recovery life, like there's a huge gap there. And peer recovery support is the middle to, so to arm them and equip them with the training that's required and go in these places and, you know, do the work that, you know, needs to be done would have a huge ripple effect like across the nation like we can pump out clinicians all day long but if they've never walked the recovery lifestyle it's not enough but if you know those that have walked it don't have the proper tools to kind of help them convey their you know legacy their journey and to help someone else build theirs funding is always the issue thank you so much phil floor is yours Sorry, just trying to find the unmute. Um, so is the funding important for peer recovery support services? Yes, it is. It has my seal of approval. Uh, but here's why. And I, I really appreciate who put together the questions. I don't know who did that. Whoever did that did a fabulous job because there is an interconnection between equity, recovery pathway, um, the workforce. All, all of these things are interconnected. And just coming at it from a um, kind of an RCO building lens, we work with RCOs all over the country, and the, one of the biggest challenges they have is, the, is sustainability and, and reliability of funding. So that, that set aside for, for organizations to be able to look down the road and know that there will be not, not money just given to them willy-nilly, because I, I assure you there's, there's a complex process for getting access to the money, but having availability of consistent and reliable funding over a period of time is critically important to building a long-term sustainable business. That's thing number one. Thing number two is the, the, the other question was how do people ensure that this happens? There are a couple of things going on. One is the, um, the set aside currently in its current state um, is, is for the current year, there is an opportunity to make that permanent. So for, for just kind of an existing piece of the budget, that's really important. And the way to do that is to reach out to your uh, house member or Senator and tell them that that's important. But there's a second piece to that. The second piece to that 
is that once the money is distributed from SAMHSA, it still goes to the states. So I believe if you're really passionate about this, you need to know who your state behavioral health organization is and how they manage the money and who are the politicians associated with appointing those people. And, and that's where there's leverage that needs to be applied at the state and, and community level as well as at the federal level. It's and if you, if you let me keep talking, I'll keep talking. So I should be. Proud. <laughs> no, that's, that's really good. Thank you. Um, we're going to move it on to Donna before we close out. I agree with what everyone has said. I can't say it any better, but I would just say that, you know, for the president to include a recovery set aside in his budget is, I, I mean, it, it just goes to show how important recovery support services are to people across the country. I mean, you know, they can be accessed anytime throughout a person's journey and to have this money available is huge. And so I would um, uh, just encourage people to reach out to make sure that we are able to see this through. And um, yeah, that's it. I'll let it go at that. Thanks, Tom. On behalf of Acting Director LaBelle, I would like to thank each of our panelists today for making this such a great discussion. I'd also like to thank Assistant Secretary Delphin Rittman for announcing the new SAMHSA Recovery Office with us today, and to thank Donna Dimitrovic for joining our panel discussion today. I hope all those watching our session enjoyed it as much as I did. Remember to join in today's International Recovery Day celebration that John Winslow told us about. And also please note that if you or a friend or loved one needs treatment, you can find appropriate local resources at SAMHSA's treatment locator, findtreatment.gov. Also, as a reminder to tune in tonight at 8.30 Eastern time on Recover Out Loud streaming event on YouTube. It will feature stories from our federal colleagues, Tom Kader at SAMHSA and Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh. For more info, go to recoveroutloud2021, all one word, dot org. So in closing, we are at a potential turning point where our voices can make an enormous difference. I encourage everyone watching our session today to reach out and see how you can help stem the tide of overdose deaths and help more Americans find recovery and fully rejoin and contribute to their communities. We all can raise our voices and roll up our sleeves to ensure that our workplaces and communities adopt policies that help people achieve recovery and to welcome them into our communities. Together, we can build a recovery ready nation, one person, one family, and one community at a time. So I call on all of you to help build a recovery-ready America. Thank you.